Welcome to Insight Analog Photography Radio Program. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and of course, the Insight Analog Photography Radio Program is all about traditional process photography. We talk about instant photography. We talk about black and white. We talk about color film. We talk about dry plate, wet plate, you name it, alternate printing processes, everything going on in analog photography. And of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. They have beautiful C41 color neg, black and white, color chrome, and of course, instant. Instant film rocks. These guys have so much great things going on right now with instant film. Of course, they have the pack film in three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five. Color, black and white, high speed black and white. But you know what's even cooler? They have the Instex cameras and film. The Instex Wide is in the country, available everywhere. And of course, right now, brand new, the Instex Mini is now in the U.S. They have cameras. They have film. This Instex Mini is two and a half by three and a half. It's the size of a business card. This is really fun stuff. You got to check it out. www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab, the place to send all your film to get developed, proofs, you name it. They got a great workflow going. www.richardphotolab.com, DR5 for the most unbelievable proprietary process to turn your black and white film into positives, into chrome. You won't believe until you get your film back as a piece of chrome will blow your mind. The dynamic range, the latitude, it's just unbelievable stuff. Definitely check it out. www.dr5.com. Iger Studios, Lenny Iger, the place to have high-resolution scans done. You know, a lot of people now are shooting analog. They're using a high-resolution scan. They're making digital negatives on an inkjet, or maybe they're going straight to an inkjet output but they're making digital negatives and they're printing contact prints. They're doing all the stuff you need to get a high resolution scan. They're using an Aztec Premier, 8,000 PPI, adjustable aperture. They can give you scans that are basically grain free. They can adjust it for every kind of film out there. This is crazy stuff going on with Lenny Iger and the guys at Iger Studios. Check them out, igerstudios.com. And of course, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. The camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder. Our media partners, www.apug.org, the Analog Photography User Group, the place on the web for all things analog process. This is a great place to learn, to share information, to get tips and tricks, the community for analog photography, www.apug.org, and of course, our photographic philanthropy partner, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, www.geh.org, the place to go to find out about the history of traditional analog photography. These people are keeping this alive. They have over 7,000 cameras in the museum of everything that's ever been made, including the Hasselblads that were shot on the moon. You name it. They have the collection. This is a great way to help support. You can be a member of George Eastman House organization. They have a lot of great things going on, but this is something you can do to help give back to photography, to help keep traditional analog photography alive for generations to come. Definitely check them out, www.geh.org. This week on Inside Analog Photo, we're going to have with us a legendary Jay Dussard. Jay is the Kodak Cowboy, awarded the Guggenheim Award in 1981. Jay has studied with Ansel Adams and Frederick Somner. He's established himself as one of the master and finest black and white printmakers alive. His work has been published, exhibited, and in collections worldwide. He is best known for the American West. Jay is the master of cowboy photography. In 1992, he was nominated for the Kodak World Image Award for Fine Art Photography. His solo book, The North American Cowboy, has won numerous awards. Jay is a really cool photographer that loves to document the Western American lifestyle. Jay lives this lifestyle with his wife near Douglas, Arizona. He's a great guy, and we're really lucky to have him with the program today. Jay, how you doing, buddy? Considering the way things have been lately, I'm doing just fine. This is great. I really appreciate you taking time today to join us here on Inside Analog Photography and just to talk to you about your beautiful photography and the stuff that you've been up to. Well, good. I'm happy to be in touch with you on this. So, Jay, tell us, you're known for shooting these stunning images of cowboys. You've done lots of documentary work and taking pictures of the West, all this great stuff you're doing. So we're going to get into all this, but tell me how you got into photography. Let's go back a few years here. What brought you around to get into photography? And then we can talk about your Guggenheim grant that you got. And how did all this start with Jay and photography? Well, I went to the University of Florida and studied architecture. I have a degree in architecture. 
graduated there in the spring of 1961. And architecture was in the College of Architecture and Fine Arts. We had a few opportunities for electives. While most of my contemporaries were taking an elective with Jerry Yulesman, the photographer, and one of my heroes, by the way, a couple of us took painting as our elective and studied with an abstract expressionist-type painter. I've always been interested in painting both realism and abstraction, but the thing that really got me interested in photography was somebody showed me a book by Aaron Siskind with these wonderful abstractions that Siskind had found in urban areas and on the shore and on docks and things like that. And it was all pure design, and it really made an impression on me because what he was accomplishing in black and white photography is what I enjoyed more than what the abstract expressionist painters were doing on their easels. The work just blew me away. It was something that made me promise myself that I would take up photography, I'd work hard at it, and get good at it. So Siskind was my first inspiration in the direction of photography. So did you move on to practice architecture? Did you just say, forget this, I want to go shoot photos? Well, in a way, that would be too simple of an answer. Let me put it this way. I got the degree in architecture, but I've never been licensed never took a state board exam. I've worked for several architects, both in Florida and in Arizona. But the best way for me to sum this up is to say that I have committed architecture, but I have never inhabited it. A long time ago, it occurred to me that it wasn't in my makeup to run a business in an urban area, and I just never got serious about trying to become an architect on my own. Well, I first started trying to make photographs in 1965, and I dug out the Ansel Adams basic photo series from the University Library in Tucson and was trying to educate myself out of those books. That's one of the great things about Ansel. He was a great teacher. Then there were a couple guys that I met that knew I was wanted to learn photography, and they were helpful to me. In fact, one of them talked me into going with him to Yosemite in June of 66, and we attended an Ansel Adams Yosemite workshop. That was really quite valuable, except that it was more of a review. I had pretty much gone over all the material on my own from the books, but being around Ansel and his assistance was the best possible kind of review. What information and feedback did you get from Ansel and his helpers on your work? Well, let me say this. I immediately started working in 4 by 5 black and white. It made a mountain photograph from the Tucson area, and there's some very dramatic desert mountains in southern Arizona. And we all had an opportunity to show some work to Ansel, and there was one photograph that he particularly liked, and He made some comment about it having a relationship to architecture. And then I guess it was about 10 years, yeah, it was exactly 10 years later that I called Ansel up and made an appointment to visit him and show him my work. That was one of the wonderful things about Adams was the fact that he was very approachable and people could come and have an audience with him and show a portfolio. Uh, By that time, I had the wonderful experience of getting to know Frederick Sommer, who I consider my mentor, and he had arranged for me to teach photography in Prescott, Arizona at a small private liberal arts school there called Prescott College. So I just sort of fell into some extremely good luck meeting Fred, who liked what I was, shall we say, trying to do, and he helped me begin to perfect it. But he also paved the way for me to teach. That put me into a position of trying to learn fast enough to stay one step ahead of my students. But I think I pulled it off. Did you always have an attraction for the West? Oh, yes. I always was attracted to the West. I was age 23 before I actually saw the inner mountain West where the sculptural landscape begins. But I had seen pictures, I had read about it, I'd read a lot of books, 
mostly fiction books about the West, and I was fascinated with the country and the inhabitants, the cowboys more so than the Indians. At age 23, I was between my last two years in architecture, I had won an academic scholarship to travel and visit American architecture. That brought me west of Oklahoma and Texas for the first time and into what I call intermountain country. It was the landscape that made a much grander impression on me than architecture did. Was part of the draw from wanting to shoot stuff in the West and cowboys from reading stuff like Western stories, Louis L'Amour? Was it things that just was well, intriguing? And what was the big draw in the West? Was it when you were a kid? Was it when you were older from college? I mean, what was the planted seed of the West deal was so cool? Was it from the Westerns in the 50s? Well, it would have been earlier than that. See, I was born in 1937. I can't say that I really grew up in the 50s. I mean, that was my high school years. But the 40s, we lived on a farm in southern Illinois. My dad didn't farm, but my grandfather and my uncle did. I feel I was more imprinted by that agricultural side of my family than my dad, who was always a city boy. I would ride a bicycle and try and keep up with a neighbor kid who had a really pretty little paint mare. He'd throw a saddle on her, and I would try my best to keep up with that horse, and it was frustrating. And I was reading cowboy novels, a lot of Will James. Will James was much more important to me, and it's only been in recent years that I've read any Louis L'Amour. So when did you make this big move from out of Florida back into Arizona? In order to stay in college in the late 50s, I had to join ROTC to keep from getting drafted out of college. So I ended up with a second lieutenant commission in the U.S. Army. And the minute I got my architecture degree, I had to go into the Army. And it was supposed to be a six-month deal, and it ended up being a two-year deal. I was sent to Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and the Texas part of my tour of duty was the most interesting for me because that's when I bought my first horse. And I was an officer in the Army, and that gave me a lot more freedom than if I'd been in the enlisted ranks. And I was able to get away and get on my horse and go help rancher friends who had country to run cattle on on the Fort Hood Military Reservation. So that's when I started Cowboy, and that would have been in 1962. It's a lot better to be running cattle on Fort Hood than it would be to other places they could have shipped you off to. Well, that's true. The place I really wanted to end up would have been Fort Huachuca, Arizona. But I had more chances in the Texas area, like Fort Bliss or Fort Hood, than I would have had in Arizona or California. So Fort Hood, it was peacetime, and I had a wonderful time there. And you stayed in for two years. That's right, yeah. I got out before Vietnam got heated up. Perfect timing. (laughs) Perfect timing, yeah. I mean, it's not as though I have an exemplary military career. I mean, I didn't get drummed out of the Corps, but I didn't go and put myself in harm's way like so many people have had to do over the years in being in the United States military. With being a second lieutenant in the Army, did they utilize you for photography, for architecture, or just leadership? Well, it was a platoon leader and the engineers in construction, and I had not even picked up a camera at that point. It was only after I got out of the Army that I even got a camera and tried to take up photography. What did you get as your first rig? What was your first camera? The first one was a Polaroid, one of the ones that had all of the pods and the film and the paper negative on a long piece of litter. I mean, this little camera, it produced prints that were three and a quarter by four and a quarter. It produced enough litter to fill a dumpster every (laughs) time you put in another film pack. And I worked with that for a very short time And in reading the Ansel Adams books. It was highly recommended that I get a 4x5 view camera. I bought a used one of them, and within just a few weeks of my attempt to take up photography, I was working in 4x5. No guts, no glory. (laughs) That's right. And, And my quest was to photograph the landscape. And the landscape is still a very important subject matter to me. I consider it the most difficult 
because so many things have to be right to be as rich as photography is capable of expressing. I'm faced with doing a two-day landscape photo workshop in just a little over a week. It's always tough to have things really fabulous when you got a group of people out there that really want to come away with something. I love the landscape, and I try to see it in a non-scenic, more abstract, more design-oriented manner. What do you find with doing landscape photography that is more difficult than, let's say, shooting cowboys? I mean, a lot of people would think that it's harder to capture that essence of a portrait than it would be of shooting some rocks. Well, the light is everything to photography because that's what we photograph. And light determines form. And if the light is too harsh on landscape elements, for example, you get highlights and shadows that interrupt the flow of form. It's a fragmentation process, and that, especially in the arid southwest, where there's such strong sunlight and so many blank skies, it's very difficult to have an image that has a good flow to it and a good sense of the architecture of the spatial elements there. I mean, the light is what provides the wonderful gifts, and compare that to photographic cowboys, That, to me, was a matter of just finding the best place, the best environmental setting to place them where the light was agreeable. And that's usually on the shady side of a barn that's high enough to surround a good background, especially with people sitting on horses. And I found that a lot easier. And I don't think I ever worried about trying to capture the essence of people. I guess you could call my images of cowboys environmental portraits. And maybe it's the environmental part of it that's more important to me than the portrait subject themselves. It's a matter of pre-visualizing and designing in my mind what's going to work as a frame. I'm set up on a tripod, and much of that stuff, Scott, was done with a 8x10 view camera. And so I would visualize how the setup would look with the people and the horses in it. Get all set up and then bring them in at the last minute. And usually let them find their positions without me doing very much in the way of instructing or choreographing or interfering. And invariably would ask them to just look at the lens. And the character took care of itself. Well, any kind of photography is essentially practical solutions to practical problems. And if you do that with a sense of design, that's what works for me. What were you shooting when you got this 4x5? Was it mainly your other friends that were doing cowboy work? Was it landscape there? What did you actually start shooting when you started shooting? That was after I had gotten out of the Army, and that was in Tucson. I was working for an architectural firm there. And then in my spare time, I was trying to teach myself photography, and I was photographing the landscape. I photographed cowboys in 1970. I got off the track of that. And I really didn't start photographing cowboys until 1980. And that's after I'd been photographing for about 15 years. Have you always done black and white or have you done color too? I see in black and white. I consider myself a black and white photographer. I have done assignment work and shot it in color, but I don't think that I'm much of a colorist. And when I was in that painting course back at the University of Florida, My color sense just was pretty boring. I'm just not anything close to a maestro having to do with color. Let's talk about your black and white work. So you get this camera, this 4x5, you're working at the architectural place. Did you jump in wholehearted, full foot? You were developing your own stuff, printing, you're doing everything yourself. Yes, in makeshift dark rooms and makeshift enlargers. And it was pretty crude. And I underexposed a lot of film. You can't make a decent black and white print from an underexposed negative. It just can't be done. And I learned the hard way how to get more workable negatives in the technical sense. I use the zone system when I'm working in black and white. Anything 4x5 on up, I am really zeroed in with the zone system. Do you find, Jay, the people that come to your classes that you're teaching have learned the zone system or want to learn the zone system? Or are most of the people that are coming to your classes all gung-ho digital and they don't even care? Well, it's changed over the years, and it's a higher percentage of digital workers now. 
and it's a little tougher for me to relate to. I have been dabbling in digital capture a little bit lately. Had some pretty good advice on what a good histogram looks like, and even got a camera that will shoot raw. But my Photoshop expertise is very, very minimal. A lot of students that I've had have understood the zone system rather well. Over many, many years, I've taught with Bruce Barnbaum a lot, and he's one of the best teachers there is, and he explains the zone system so much better than I ever could. But the zone system is very, very useful. The main thing to understand about the zone system is if you want plenty of detail in a dark shadow, you better place that on zone 4 rather than zone 3. And there are a lot of zone 3 shadow exposures have been going on for years and years. And in a way, you can kind of attribute that to Ansel Adams. My biggest influence in expressive printing is Frederick Summer. And he was very generous with me, and we photographed together only a couple of times. But the times that we spent together in the darkroom were really fantastic. And he explained to me why you need quality negatives. You needed especially good separations in the shadows so that you could articulate some of the deeper, darker passages in a print. I mean, the print is where the expression of the image occurs. I learned how to bleach prints, potassium ferrocyanide reduction on the prints, not in a remedial way, but in a very positive and creative way. That's the way Fred used it on just about all of his images, and I learned it from him, and I was stuck with having to do it on 95% of my darkroom prints because it was necessary to clarify what's going on in the deeper tones. I'd kind of like to think of a good print as sort of like a brass choir. And your highlights are what the trumpets play, and your middle tones are what the French horns play, and your dark tones are what the trombones and tubas play. There's got to be clarity throughout that entire musical spectrum, just like there has to be clarity throughout the entire visual spectrum. Yeah, I think information value in a print is most important. It sounds like an egg-headed technical approach to photography, but it has so much to do with expression. Really, the print is the final piece. I mean, if you don't have a print, you don't have a photograph. That's right. And the organization of that pictorial space is so important. And I like to think of not composing a photograph, but designing a photograph. And you can see where that's coming from here. I studied architecture for so many years. It was in the design courses that I did my best work. And I'm used to standing between the legs of a tripod, working slowly, looking at something that's upside down on a big ground glass. And I really like the 8x10 ground glass the best. But this doesn't mean that to design a photograph, you have to work slowly and do it in the blink of an eye. I consider Cartier-Bresson the ultimate designer of photographic images. And he was working in instants of time, working instantaneously. But he and the best of the miniature camera shooters could design in the blink of an eye. Yeah, it's all about, I guess, what you're looking to capture and how technical and how quick you think you can do it. Like you said, Brasson was quick and able to grab these images of things going on in the street and things happening with people in the blink of an eye. So... But doing these huge landscapes, like the stuff that you've been shooting, and especially things in the Southwest with such a harsh environment, I don't think you can do them that quick. You really can't. But at some point, I got interested in wide-angle panoramic work. In that Phoenix Airport show, there's a couple of panoramic landscapes there. But my best one was of the goosenecks of the San Juan River in Utah. I built a 4x10 super-wide camera, and it would take two lenses then I would ask more of the lenses than they were designed to do. So I got all this wonderful peripheral distortion that I really enjoy. I mean, the human eye does not see a wide field in the same way that a wide-angle lens does. It's so different, and that's why much of wide-angle photography is very, very exciting. Let's talk about that, Jay. What are you shooting on here currently? I am doing my portraits, and a lot of that are working cowboys. But I'm shooting medium format, 6 by 9 centimeter, 
and I'm using a Fuji rangefinder camera with a 90 millimeter lens on it. And it's not wide angle. It's a little wider than normal, but I pretty much use that for everything that I used to use a 4x5 for, and then before that, an 8x10. Isn't that a great camera? Oh, I love it. It's so good that they quit making it. It's like <laughs> so many things in our life. Things get so good that they disappear. And are you shooting with the 691, 2, or the 3? Do you have a removable lens on yours, or is it fixed? No, no, it's a fixed lens. Yeah, I guess it's called a 693. I can't remember. Numbers escape me. No, but that's a great camera. I have a 692, and I love it, with a leaf shutter, and it's a fun rig. Yeah, it is. The main pitfall, you got to remember to take the lens cap off. <laughs> this is true, but you can't go wrong with a 6x9 is a good size piece of film. It is. It's great. And I've been collaborating with my friend Carlos Mandela Villatia at True Res in Scottsdale, and he's been making these big prints of mine. And I guess he worked with a 6 by 9 centimeter negative and made a 4 foot by 6 foot inkjet enlargement. It's just amazing. And the Fuji lenses are great, and that was shot on Kodak T-Max 400. That's a beautiful film, but I'm transitioning to Fuji Neopan 400 right now. And so far, that's proven to be a wonderful film, too. It's a little faster. And I've got a big project coming up where I'm going to be doing a lot of portraits of working cowboys. And I need to be specific about what they are. They are the contemporaries that practice the old vaquero skill. They're the buckaroos of northern Nevada and southeast Oregon and southern Idaho and parts of California. They're the Great Basin cowboy culture. These are the guys that call themselves buckaroos. And their tradition, very proudly, is that of the California vaqueros. And the big project that I'm working on now is shooting stills for a film project called The Legacy of the California Vaquero. And it is being produced by EISF. That's the Essential Image Source Foundation out of Santa Barbara. And a lot of that is action photography using Sony's best, most up-to-date video equipment. And then I'm documenting the action in 35 millimeter color and I might be able to move into some digital capture for that. But the black and white portraits of these people, and these are just top hands. They're just fabulous horsemen, horsewomen, and cattle workers. And I'm shooting the portraits in 6 by 9 120 roll film. Yeah, that neopan is beautiful stuff, though. Yeah, I'm liking that, and, and I got a bunch of it in the freezer. Now I'm just waiting for the go-ahead when we get this project going again. We had the first shoot, it's been right at two years ago, in Koyama, California. And we had 30 of the top practicing contemporary buckero, buckaroo types. We had about 100 horses and 100 cows for them to rope and do their demonstrations on. The crew shot lots and lots of footage. They got countless hours of high-definition footage, and then I shot stills. This is going to end up as a documentary film and maybe a feature film, a theater film. Then about seven art museums are lined up to exhibit both the films and the stills. The Autry Museum in Los Angeles is probably where it'll first show up. This is a really fabulous project. No, it sounds like it's going to be really fun. It's remarkable to me that California is high-tech and overpopulated and fast-paced as it is. Also, in the background of all this is this wonderful cattle culture that has got these fabulous horseback practitioners of the old buckero arts. And they're roping with rawhide ropes rather than nylon or poly ropes. And these are hand-braided rawhide ropes that are 60, 70, 80 feet long. And they're not tied to the saddle horn. They rope and wrap the loose rope around the saddle horn to stop the animals. And nobody's in a hurry. It's not like rodeo. Not at all like the roping events you'd see in rodeo. Which That's something that's fabulous in its own way, but I'm much more attracted to this kind of work that derives from ranching. Well, this all derives from, I guess, early California, and that would be actually Mexico. 
Well, yeah, it goes back to Spain, but Mexico was where it was first practiced. I think some of the earliest New World ranches were in Mexico in the 1500s. And then in time, this came up into Texas. And for our purposes, more importantly, came into California. And the California climate and landscape lent itself to a more relaxed and artful style of working with horses and cattle. And the cowboy world that came up Mexico into Texas, and some of it from farther east, even the Gulf Coast, it was a little bit more utilitarian and a little bit more rough and tumble. I have a tremendous admiration for cowboys of all stripes and traditions. They're the best people in the world, and they're very proud of their tradition and they're proud of their skills. Ranching has taken some big hits lately. It's considered by many environmentalists to be pretty destructive and rough on the land, but that's hardly the case. It's an important thing. It helps to keep open space open, and it's consistent with marginal country, rough country, mountain country, desert country, in a way that can be productive and at the same time beneficial. To get too mechanized with ranching involving ATV or quad runners and helicopters, and mechanized equipment for processing cattle for branding and things like that. That has really been what has caused some of these old fabulous horsemanship and roping skills to sort of disappear. And so what we're doing here with this documentary is we're honoring the people who are keeping that tradition alive. And that tradition is not inconsistent with profitable ranching. I would think that the traditional tradition would be actually more profitable. Well, there's less of demand for fossil fuel to make it work. A horse is a lot cheaper to run than a four-wheel drive pickup. Yet, sometimes you'll load a bunch of horses into a trailer and use a truck to transport them out to where the job needs to be done. But to do as much as you can horseback, it can be quite cost-effective. But to somebody like me, looking at it from the art end of it, it's just the preservation of some very magnificent skills. Do you find that there are people still living the true, original, Western cowboy lifestyle still? Yeah, they are. They're trying hard to do so. And if they've got a cell phone in their pocket when they're out horseback, that's not counterintuitive. I just finished doing the photography for a story that's in the November issue of Western Horseman, and it's about a ranch that's near where I live. This is a very progressive ranch that uses a lot of high-tech stuff. They're off the grid, so they've got wind generators and they've got windmills or solar pumps to get water out of the ground. they got pipelines to distribute the water. But they're capturing a lot of solar power and wind power to run the ranch. But they do everything horseback. Gathering of cattle and to rope calves to brand, we we do that horseback. And I'm part of the crew much of the time. I guess you could say one of the things that has been an obsession of mine, not just to photograph cowboys, I'm not just a photographer out there, but I'd rather be on a horse following cows and be able to come to a destination and rope something to brand. I mean, that is pretty addictive for me. And I really don't like to have a camera in my hands or in a saddlebag or in a pouch when I'm wanting to just be a cowboy. I don't consider myself a genuine article cowboy or a real deal cowboy, but I love to participate in it and it helps me understand it better. Well, you've had horses for a long time. I mean, you're much closer than many. Well, probably so. Ever since I bought my first horse at Fort Hood in 1962, I waste money and use a shovel for many, many years. Oh, lots of hay. i got too many right now. And I'm getting old. It's hard for me to keep up with young horses. They're just sort of almost getting to be too much for me. Jay, of course, have this great project coming up here. What else do you look forward to in your photography that you haven't got to shoot yet that you want to do? Well, I'm always on the lookout for abstraction. A year ago, Lenswork number 78 ran a portfolio of my abstractions, which was the first time they'd ever been published. And I'm always on the lookout for that. I'll probably end up doing a book in conjunction with this Legacy of the California Vaquero Project. That may be my last book. 
and you already know what that's going to be, and it's going to be more portraits of these people, and there'll probably be other things. Maybe some landscape images can be integrated into that. I'm looking for a place for my archive to end up, and I couldn't have picked a worse economic time to do that one. None of the institutions have got money to take on an archive. I should have started seriously sooner. So that's something that I've got a great concern about. To have more work exhibited, mainly to perpetuate this cowboy vaquero buckaroo tradition, that's really important to me. But my landscape images, I'm still attracted to that. I haven't been photographing a lot lately, and I've been doing even less darkroom work. I've been spoiled by being able to collaborate with Carlos in Scottsdale. The guy is a maestro, and talk about being on the same wavelength with the guy. He's an old film shooter, so he knows where I'm coming from. There have been some corporate placement of some of my big images in landscapes. Panoramic landscapes have gone into some banks here lately. I'm well thought of by an international interior design firm and I'm sure that they're going to place some more of my big black and white images, I hope, around the world. And some of the things that work best big are the abstraction. And the fact that landscapes, which are very dear to me, have been what has been sold to some banks, that is very satisfying. No, I mean, your abstractions are beautiful work. I mean, people really need to see this stuff in person. But it is stunning, and it's very cool that some of the abstraction stuff that I've seen is actually from Western content. I guess stuff that you've been able to find when you've been out shooting these cowboys and some of the other stuff to be able to build these prints that are just beautiful. Well, yeah, that's true. It's really a very hazy line between my abstractions and my landscapes. And that's great. Sometimes I could call a certain image one or the other. And I kind of like ambivalence anyway. Frederick Summer loved it. He's my hero. So, Jay, what's the best way for people to look at what you're doing? Of course, we would love to chat some more here on another show to get in-depth and more of some of this environmental portraiture and this beautiful work you're doing. But in the meantime, how do people look at what you're doing, check out your work, maybe some of the galleries? I mean, you have a lot of stuff in museums. How do they go look at what you're doing? Well, I am working on a website now, which I hope gets underway before too long. It would just be www.jdusard.com. If you punch that up right now, you'll end up where the documentary about me, the one called Keeping the West Western, where that was shot, but we're going to fix that. But the best place to look right now is www.tinysatellitepress.com. That is in Scottsdale, and they're the people that published my California Vaquero portfolio. It was with them, and especially with Carlos, that we've done these big monumental-sized prints. But www.tinysatellitepress.com, that's the go-to place for me right now. This is great stuff. I really appreciate you, Jay, taking some time to spend to talk about yourself, your photography. We didn't even get a chance to get into your whole Guggenheim grant and the other stuff you're doing. So I think we can save this for another program to talk about some of this other work you're doing, because I think what you're doing is very historic in documenting the American West the American cowboy, and what's been going on here, and it's just stunning work. Well, thank you, Scott. I look forward to us getting together in another extended conversation. And when the word documentary occurs in connection with my name, it's almost a byproduct of my vision because I'm designing photographs, and if something that I've discovered and designed it ends up having documentary value, that's a wonderful secondary occurrence. No, I think it is your vision to document these Western people, this photography, and your love for horses and the West in itself. And it just goes to show your passion for what you're doing actually ends up being a documentary. But it's like you said, it's not the prominent thought to start with. That was just what you want to do. And it ends up being such great work that it is documentary based. Yeah, well, that pretty much sums it up. I mean, I've never considered myself primarily a documentary photographer. No, but you've done such a great job in documenting this whole Western culture that it is just stunning. It's great work. Well, thank you, Scott. I appreciate your kind words, and it's sure been a pleasure speaking with you today. And I definitely look forward to it here real soon, Jay. Thank you so much, buddy. Oh, you bet. It's a deal. Well, there you go. 
Jay Dussard, one of the living American masters of photography. Jay has the most unbelievable work that you will ever see. There's a huge exhibit going on now at the airport in Phoenix. There's been numerous television programs about Jay. You really need to look at his website, what he's up to. Just check out his work. It is literally stunning. His way that he captures the true cowboy, the American West, with him being involved in this for so many decades, the whole Western lifestyle and the ethics that go along with cowboys and leadership. It's really great work. And Jay's an excellent photographer and a really great gentleman. You really need to check out his work. Beautiful, beautiful photography. The Inside Analog Photography radio program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful over at www.fujifilmusa.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com. DR5 over at www.dr5.com. Iger Studios over at igerstudios.com. Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. And, of course, our media partners, APUG, the Analog Photography User Group, over at www.apug.org. Our photography, philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film over at www.geh.org. I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photography Radio. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 